I uh, I really like all three of them. I think they they all have different strengths and weaknesses. Jason, a um, little more laid back, a little bit older, and Carrie's a little bit older, and she's um, she's high energy. Drew is young, but he is uber high energy, you know, but. I don't, you know, it's according to what they're looking for. Are you, are you looking for, you know, I think Carrie might be at a disadvantage and I hate that because all the other administrators are female and there's a four administrative team. And so that may give Drew and Jason the leg up. Um, and of those two, it's do you want a 45 year old man or uh, who's a little more seasoned and a little calmer, or do you want the young hard charger who's probably Drew's probably thirty and just a rocket? Yeah. Do you which of those do you, which of those personalities will fit in with your school community and with your administrative team? And there's a clear choice there. Now I have met all the people there, and I suspect I know which one they'll pick, but I, I don't want to say it out loud because I don't want to jinx the other one. <laughs> um, um, but those are the kinds of things that you have no control over. And one of the things that I wanted to start out with you tonight about McGregor's X and Y, but I want to talk to you a little about interviewing. You know, I've given you all the materials and we'll go through all the different types of interviews later this semester. But in preparation for that, and it goes along with X and Y tonight, um, the secret to interview, there, there is a secret to interview. One, I never write this down. It's not in Dale's notes for the, or top 10 for interviews. I don't write down any of that stuff. This, this is, but this is the secret to interviewing. You will be asked a question, no doubt, about your strengths and weaknesses. That is the most important question that you will answer ever in an interview. All the things that you list as your strengths need to be dispositional, need to be personality based. I'm dedicated, I'm hardworking, I'm responsible, I'm reliable, I'm professional, I'm ethical. All of those themes that you see in Strength Finder, all of your strengths should be based on you, your disposition, things that won't change as a fully formed adult. Conversely, all of your weaknesses should be based on your lack of experience things that are correctable. Do not say, well, I'm not really a morning person. That's dispositional. <laughs> That's dispositional. That's not going to change. You're a fully formed adult. I would never hire somebody in the school business who said, I'm, I'm not much of a morning person. Or I don't <laughs> like kids. Exactly. That, that, that was, for exactly. Exactly. Or, or, or interviewing for an administrative job is I don't really get along with other adults. <laughs> now, you know as well as I do that that's what you're doing. You're interviewing for a job to work with adults. Well, and I've had people seriously tell me those three things. I don't like kids. That's why I'm getting out of the classroom. Hey, Ray. How are you? Can't hear me yet. I can hear you now. Okay. Hope you're doing well. I'm doing better. I think I can come to next week. <laughs> I was thinking about taking next week off then. <laughs> well, listen, I'm I'm liking this whole video thing. I like it too. I think I think you know, take your time, get well. Yeah. We'd love to see you. Thank you. All right, we're talking about McGregor's X and Y and motivation, and I've started out. If you could hear me, you just logged in. What I've started out with is. Um, related to interviewing, that when you interview, the secret to interviewing is the, the strength and weaknesses questions they're gonna ask you. Strength should always be dis dispositional. I'm dependable, I'm reliable, I'm responsible, I'm ethical, I'm legal, those things. And your weaknesses should always be based on uh, lack of experience, things that can be fixed. Don't, don't give a weakness that's dispositional as a fully formed adult, that's not going to change. Um, and so, Quite seriously, I've had people come in and tell me things like, 
I don't like working with adults that are applying for administrative jobs. I don't like working for adults. I don't like kids. I'm not a morning person. Don't speak to me until I've had my coffee. Um, I don't like driving at night. I mean, all this long list of dispositional things that, that you realize really quickly is I, there's nothing, what can I, what can I say to that? What can I do to fix that? There's nothing I can do to fix who you are. Um, now, if you come in and say, I'm, I've not been certified in teacher evaluation yet, but I know that I need that to happen and I'll do that as quickly as I can. Um, hey, um, that, that's doable. That's fixable. You know, we, we can address that. Everybody's got to get their first job. Everybody's not going to have experience. Everybody's got to get their first job. Um, so, um, make sure that your weaknesses are experience-based things that you can fix. I was asked those questions in my interview. Yes, of course you were. Yes. And so, luckily, I answered them right. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, we've been through this, and I have those in the principal interview question. But yes, um, hopefully you will. I was telling them the job at Davis Drive and Kerry. Our folks, three of our folks, got interviews. Uh, my interns, our interns, my interns. And they will all, I'm sure, do a great job. I'm okay. excited about that. Um, each has their own strengths, but it speaks well of all three of them. I'm very proud of them. All right. All right, let me share the screen and get started. So what I want us to start out with tonight. Now I've told you the story before I know about when I was principal up in Burke County during the, the career development years. That was North Carolina's 1980s version of trying to differentiate pay for teachers. Um, and uh, one of the independent, we had OEs, observer evaluators, that were independent people that came in and evaluated lessons. They weren't tied to the school. Or it, yes, you remember those people. Well, one of them told me something one time, and he had a good sense of humor. And so did, I had two that worked our school, and they both had a good sense of humor, and they said, you know, you can tell if a teacher, I think it was Belinda was the, I think quite coincidentally was her name. She said, you can tell if a teacher is an optimist, a pessimist, or a realist uh, personality type by how they condition their children before you come in as the observer or evaluator. If they are an optimist, they will promise their children reward and if they'll behave while the observer's in the room. <laughs> if they're a pessimist, they'll threaten them with, you know, with, you know, with death if they don't behave. And if they're a realist, they'll do both. Um, which speaks to McGregor's X and Y. All X is bad and all Y is bad. See, a lot of folks think, well, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be positive. You know, I'll, I'll use reward. You cannot, you can neither punish nor reward your way to, to good behavior or desired behavior if that's all you use. You have to learn to use a combination of both. Um, if you'll remember that MTSS model that I, that we looked at in in, in 602, it contains both elements of punishment and reward. Do you remember that? So if we look at it, the, the, the 
we are rewarding the, the best teachers by having them teach the others and getting to be empowered in school. But even the, our low performing teachers, we give them a whole nine weeks of one-on-one -on -one coaching without any, you know, they don't have to pay for it, that there is no threat, there's no, there, there's no nothing that comes with that in terms of punishment. It is a reward. It is positive reinforcement. But what happens after nine weeks if they don't do better? They get nine more weeks of that same coaching, but now they get they get the, the negative. They get the action plan. So all plans for instructional improvement have to have both components in it. And as a leader, you have to understand that. As I told you last week when we were looking at Hertzberg, you cannot be a satisfier. You can be a dissatisfier if you're negative all the time, but being positive all the time won't be won't 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 be, you won't become a satisfier either. Many times, if you're positive all the time and all you do is reward, people dislike that as much as they like being punished all the time because you're rewarding people who don't do as well as you. If you ever work for somebody that that gave everybody a sticker, no matter even if they didn't do anything sticker being a euphemism, uh, you know, whatever, gave everybody a shirt on the <laughs> faculty or, or praised everybody or gave everybody reward regard and different didn't differentiate between the people who were really working hard and the people who were, you know, dragging the, the whole process down. So rewarding all the time, you know, is a disincentive to, to the people who are actually doing the work because, um, they see that people not doing the work getting rewarded, but on the other end, if you punish all the time, the people, um, the people who do the work are, are disincentivized by that also. So you have to have a combination of the X and the Y. Hopefully that doesn't run contrary to your personality. Um, some folks find it very, very difficult to be hard on, on other folks. To do the negative, and then you have people like me who enjoyed that part and had, to, and had a hard time doing the positive. You have to strike a balance, and so to do that, you have to know yourself, which leads us to obviously our first exercise of the evening is um, put my glasses back on where I can see here. I need to go back to my desktop. There it is. Okay. Okay. Where is it here? Okay. There is a link under tonight's lesson three. Did y'all see that? What is your leadership style? This is from, this goes back to Lewin, Kurt Lewin. Um, I think it's live. You could actually take it. Um, okay. Can y'all see this? Y'all want to take this or just want me to work through it with you? All right. So what we're trying to figure out here is what your leadership style is in terms of are you participative, are you autocratic, or are you uh, laissez-faire? You just let it happen. Or are you, do you participate and in, in, in engage in transformational leadership as we talked about before, where we motivate and inspire and work alongside? Um, or are you one of those that is very authoritarian, that it's always my way or the highway, the very, the very X person? So what we're looking for is a balance of X and Y here. Uh, and we call that participative. So let's see how, let's see how we do. All right. To be a participative leader, somebody who can balance X and Y, I'll do the first one for you here. I make the final decision, but I accept a lot of input from my team. As I've told you before, you can delegate um, activities, but you can't delegate responsibility. I, you have to be, in the end, you, are, you will be held accountable for decisions made. So I make the final decision, and you have to, because that's your job as a leader, but you do accept a lot of input from my team. And there's two key, key phrases in that, in, in that 
that sentence there. Input and team. See, see what I like about that is, is, is it doesn't say input from others. It's already, the assumption here is you've already formed a team of people, that you're working in teams. Um, that's, that's one of the first functions of being a transformational leader is team and forming teams. Um, work to the, where the idea is to work together in, uh, toward a common goal. All right, so that's the first one. All right, what, what is the transformational participative answer for number two? I consider suggestions made by others in the group. All right, that is correct. How many times, oh, I know you're gonna hate me for this, doing your evidence artifact, did you read the word collaboration? A lot. Wonder why? The whole idea of the evidence artifact process is to, to teach you how to build a school improvement plan using collaborative leadership. Not just going to your office or hiding at your weekend cabin or whatever and writing the thing and then, you know, rolling it out. The whole idea is, is that you divide into teams and you have a team leader or a PLC chair that takes a section of your, of your school leadership plan and that you work between them. Um, in 604 last semester, one of the things that, that we worked toward was, you know, we went back, we revisited the four and PLCs about how to run one and then how to, how to, how to how to set one up, how to run one. Then we, we moved to the, the, the next level, how to manage multiples, where you're managing multiple PLCs as a leader. And so that, you know, for your school improvement plan, you probably need six, maybe seven teams. Um, it's according to how your disciplinary data turned out last year. You may have to have a, a, a seventh team. But you need one for instructional program, that's the app cell. You need one for staff development program, that's the app tell. Community and parent. Sometimes you do community and parent. That's some, that might be one group or it might be two. Um, and then you need one that basically works on the schedule and those things. You need a scheduling group. Uh, and then you need a, a cultural group that works on TWC. And then the optional group is, and I've told you this before, if your acts of crime and violence exceed the state average, or if your out of school suspensions exceed the state or local average, you have to write, you have to form an additional group and write a school safety plan as an addendum to your regular school improvement plan. So those are the groups that you've got to manage. Uh, in terms of school leadership groups. Now, I'm not talking about the PLC for the fourth grade where they're talking about dibbles or, you know, excuse me, second grade where they're talking about, I'm talking about school-wide leadership PLCs that you now have to manage to help you lead the building. Okay. So let's, let's understand that we've, 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 our PLCs have now, as I said, we've gone to advanced PLCs now. The ones that are leadership-based PLCs that are doing things outside of the classroom in terms of school leadership. You have to learn how to form and manage those as a leader if you're going to be a transformational or participative leader. You have to, you use the same format that you would for a fourth grade one or a reading one, but, but obviously your goals are different in, in these. And you have to learn how to manage all of them and the workflow and make sure you get to each one of them to make sure you inspire them to do the work. Um, it's 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 a it's another level of management a layer of management and it's another skill that you have to develop as an administrator to, to, to manage those groups. But first one, team, collaboration. Um you're kind of getting the, the gist of this thing now. Um when it comes to giving orders, I tell group members what to do, how to do it, and when I want it done. I provide direction, but also support and accept feedback. Obviously, we know that's the one. Now, as I've told you, when you come out of the principal's meeting in CMS, and when you go to the principal's meeting, you have a huge, they give you a huge stack of, of materials, huge. You need a boy to carry it. You can't carry it all yourself. 
but what you do while they're up, you know, at, at, in, at the beginning, in the first hour or hour and a half when they're doing, you know, the, the superintendent or whoever's getting up and doing the philosophy and the vision and all that business that you've heard before, you sit and, and make three stacks out of, out of that big stack, you make three smaller stacks. One of them is, and they, they follow along this order. Um, here are things that we're being told to do and how to do it and when to do it from the central office. Put that in one stack. Then you have one that they've given you where you can provide direction and you can accept feedback and you can implement the way you want to. And then you have a third stack that's just for your information. It's just, you know, out there kind of as a fair stuff. Because there are different types of people and personalities and different objectives in the central office as well. When we think of the central office, we think of it as one body. You know, it's not one body with, with it is a multi multi-faceted thing with a lot of different people who have a lot of different styles. Now, the people who are over in the data in the data area, they want it done this way on time, everybody for reliability purposes, so they can compare the results. I mean, I'm not I'm not blasting those people. I am one of those people. I understand that. That we can't let you, we can't let Christy at Huntersville put it in a way different than Christy at Quail Hall. If we're, going to, if we're going to try to compare the results, for reliability purposes, we have to implement it the same with fidelity. So you make a stack of those things. Now, there's some things that, you know, we want, you have to do this, but we'll give you, we'll delegate how you do it. And you make that stack. And in that FYI stack, that big dumpster right outside the back door of the old staff development, that's what that was for. You didn't even bother to take it back to your school. It was full by the end of, of, of Francis' meeting. Really, it was overflowing. That big huge dumpster they had back there. They had to bring a second just for principals meeting every month. Now, when you go back to your school and you do the next faculty meeting on Wednesday, as you know you do, the first thing that you have to do is be honest with people and say, all right, first 15 minutes of the business session, um, here's what we have to do. And it came from you know the principal's meeting this month, and you're honest with them. We have to do it this way at this time. There, there, there is no discretion on this. That's why I would tell them. Don't argue with me. Don't, don't say there's a better way to no. Just, just, just no. This is, this has to be done this way and done now. Uh, now here's some things that we have discretion over. We will, we will work on these in. We used to call them committees. We will work on these in committee, uh, and I will be with you. Um, um, we call them professional learning committees back in those days, and now they've changed that C to communities. But, uh, but we called them PLCs then, but they were communities. Um, or committees, excuse me. Um, so we'll work on these in committee. But you need to be clear. People will respect that you don't have any discretion, but the worst thing that you can do, and this is how this long-winded story to get to this point, never tell people that they have decision-making capability when you know they don't, just in hopes that they'll pick what you need for them to pick and you look like a hero. Don't, don't be doing the hero deal. Don't, no white horses here. Just tell them up front, no, this is how it has to be done. Don't say, yeah, we can do what we want to here and hope that they pick the way that they're supposed to do it. And then when they don't pick that way, what do you do? Well, I'm sorry you have then that's not that's not transformational leadership. Transformational leaders inspire and work, but they tell the truth. They tell you what your choices are and when you have choices. And when you don't have choices, they tell you that too. So I provide direction, you know, I, I, I tell you whether we can, we, we, this is a fidelity deal or, or, or it's, or we have discretion, you know, and then, um, and then we go forward from there. If a group member makes a mistake, they need supportive feedback and additional guidance. You can see that that would be the appropriate answer there. One's negative, one's positive, and, and this one, um, they need supportive feedback and additional guidance. And that doesn't mean that there won't be, you know, some ramifications. Um, but you, you can't punish your way to desired behavior, nor can you just only reward your way. How much do you monitor members of your group? I watch, I carefully watch to make sure they're performing. I check once in a while, let them know I'm available if they need help. 
So I said, you need to learn how to manage those school-wide PLCs where you get to all of them. Don't get bogged down. You know, basically what you should do is make sure that you hit all of them, but one of them, if one of them has a question or a problem or needs help, that, you know, if you've got, if you're doing this and you've got 60 minutes, that you're going to spend half of it with that one group and hit the other five groups five minutes each. But every group needs to be visited every time that you have these one of these school-wide sessions. Which best describes your approach to motivating team members? People are more motivated when they feel involved and valued, obviously. Yeah. Now, I'm going to test your how, well, I don't know how long ago y'all had a psychology class. That first one, people are motivated by clear awards and punishments. Who was, the, who, who the behaviorist that, that believed in that? Pavlov, the Pavlovian experiment, you know, that ring the bell, that, that's a function of this, but the behavioralist that, who spoke about reward punishment was Skinner, B.F. Skinner. But, and, and Pavlov was part of that experiment, but Skinner talked about reward and punishment. Um, that you could condition behaviors based on reward and punishment. And Pavlov conditioned the dog to salivate when he heard the bell ring because he thought he was going to get the reward of getting to eat. That's an extension of Skinner's work. But you know, if you're a Skinnerian behavioralist, you believe that you believe in reward and punishment, um, that you don't believe in intrinsic motivation, uh, desire, uh, you know, you believe in management versus leadership, basically. That's that's where that's that's the bottom line. I just summarized all of Psych 101 for you. If you're a Scenarian behavioralist, um, you believe in reward and punishment. Um, you know, you are a manager. That's what you are destined to be. If you believe that there's more than that, that there is people can be motivated and inspired, and, and inspired, then you can you can become a leader. But if you are a Scenarian, you can only ever be a manager. I know that was one of your first, that you're reading that you're doing in one of your first uh, discussions, what's the difference between leadership and management. That's it right there. If you believe only in reward punishment, uh, then you, you are a manager. And you can't, again, that's dispositional, folks. See, that, that's... Those are the kinds of things that we try to ferret out in interviews. That's dispositional. That that Skinnerian behavior belief that people are, are only motivated by reward and punishment, that's dispositional. That's part of your DNA. That's part of your personality. We're not going to change that. And it's really going to affect how you work with people. It's always going to be transactional power, rewards or punishments. Never going to be transformational leadership. It's only going to be transactional management. You don't have the capacity to be a, a true leader and inspire others. Um, and that's what we're trying to ferret out in the interviews. Can this person really be a manager or a leader? Or are they just destined to, you know, to be a manager all their life? We're not looking for managers when we're in executive leadership positions. We're not looking for managers. Now, Years ago, we used to look for people in the assistant principal ranks who just were managers, kind of like a sergeant in the army that, that managed everything. But those days are long gone. Sometimes we called them dean of men, and now that we've kind of got a dean of students that, that does that. But see, I would be afraid to be in one of those positions that I'd get locked in and could never get out, and nobody would ever look at me as a leader because I'm just doing management functions. Um, but, you know, when I became a high school teacher a million and a half years ago, Mr. Norris was the assistant principal slash dean of men. And that's all he ever wanted to do. Um, there was one at the high school at the other end of the county. Grady Pope was down there. And Mr. Pope was assistant principal forever and ever and ever. Was, he, was, he was assistant principal athletic director. Did management, did never, never was in, had anything to do with leadership, never wanted to be a principal. The worst, the worst month or two of his life, as told by him, was when they made him be an interim middle school principal to finish out the year. 
uh, one of the most tragic things in my career, uh, Charles Toms was principal at Cold Springs Middle School. He was at the Institute of Government in Chapel Hill back in the old days when it was still on campus doing the principal's executive program. You've heard of PEP. Uh, he was doing PEP and he got sick. Now, Charles was just like strong as a horse that ran a farm principal. I mean, he was like, you know, he was like Arnold Schwarzenegger back in those days. And he got sick in Chapel Hill and they took him to the, the hospital there and they diagnosed him with stage four leukemia and said, we have to give him the treatment. If he doesn't, he's going to die and maybe he may die anyway. And he died. And so he died that week that he was there at PEP. He was in his 44 years old. And so we had to have an interim in the district to fill that out. And so they got Grady to do it from, he was, and he hated it. He just absolutely hated it. Now he told some colorful stories that I better not tell on tape. <laughs> But he just hated, he did not want to be a leader. He was he was most comfortable being a manager. We used to hire a lot of assistant principals in those ranks. What did you notice has happened to the number of assistant principals in North Carolina in the last seven years, eight years, 10 years? It started in 2007 and then really in 2008 with the crash. But, but since 2008, I guess that's nine years now, we kind of go through what, what has happened to the number of assistant principals in the state in, in nine years. We've lost half of them in nine years. We've lost half of the existing assistant principals in North Carolina. Um, and so our principals have to come from those ranks. And so do you think that we, it would be behoove us to hire the management types that are going to become the, the instructional leaders and the leaders in our building? No, we're not hiring any of those people anymore. What we've done is like in Charlotte Mecklenburg, we've created the teacher class of people that are paid as teachers, dean of, a dean of students to do those kinds of things. We're not looking for assistant principals who are, who are managers anymore. We're looking for assistant principals who can project as leaders. I told you Mo that was here, um, he went to Greensboro. He started, he started interviewing all the assistant principal candidates as superintendent because he knew that they were likely to be the people who would be his principal. Don't hire a management person as an AP and then then, then blame them, but they, they're not principal material. Don't hire them to begin with. Um, so you have to project as a leader if you want that job, not as a manager, and your weaknesses have to be based on inexperience, not dispositional. A group members are most motivated by I think a need for participation to be a member of the group. Can you accept input from group members? Why yeah. would it be a need for security? There's so many people that say they just want to make sure they have their job. If they had their job and they knew that they, somebody knew that they did it well, that motivated them. All right, I'll, I'll make this a short, quick answer. This is from number seven, Larray, if y'all didn't hear, hear her, she said, why is it not a need for security? Because the, the question started out with group members. You're exactly right. If that said individuals, they are, what, are, what are individuals most motivated by according to Maslow's hierarchy theory of safety and security? That's number one for individuals. Uh, okay. trick, the trick in this question is it says group members. Got it. Okay. Okay. Excellent point. Excellent point, though. That's a good point. Remember, group dynamics is much different than individuals. Group members are motivated by the need to participate. Individuals are motivated by safety security. And I feel like okay. That's exactly have to. That's exactly have to define their role within the group. That's exactly right. Now you just, I just taught you Psych 102. <laughs> We're brazing right through the catalog tonight. You're exactly right. All right. And, and a lot of what you're going to be doing as a leader is psychology. Now, you, and you're not using your powers for evil to try to trick people or get one over on them. You're trying to, to motivate people and you're trying to use it from a positive perspective in order to achieve your objectives. When things go wrong, I tend to ask others for ideas and solutions, expect others, figure out things on my own. You need to collect data. You need to get input. Um, you know, and 
what is it that Jeff always says? Um, we have to move on and figure out why, not just stand at the, at the, at the funeral all the time. And we, we, we have to move on from that. Uh, it's dead, move on, figure out why, it, why it's dead and, and try to get input and collect data. Uh, find out from people why. I want the people in my group to feel like they are involved in the process and can add something to the group. That goes back to what Christy just said. They're trying to find their place in the group. That's exactly right. Leaders can succeed by helping people reach their potential. Self, what is it? Self-actualize, isn't that the, the more modern term now? I believe that's the term. The best decisions involve group consensus. When it comes to assigning duties, uh, I let members of the team, I think, do what needs to be done. I think, I think they left out a do there. Democratic, participative, um, those are interchangeable. Uh, but again, it says you can, you have to be able to switch between you use an authoritarian, that's X, if a group member lacks knowledge about, you know, delegated. You, you may have to use some of these behaviors at X and Y. But your, your first thought must be the answers that we just gave right there. Not just your first thought, your first action. Um, see, here's the problem. I have an article right now that I'm trying to dissect and read and it's about psycho psychometrics, psych psychometric data collection. It's not about, and, and what psychometric does is it collects everything that it knows about you, everything the data you find from your purchases, everything about you. And what it seeks to do is predict what you will do. Again, let me say this again. It seeks to predict what you will do rather than what you think you will do or say you will do. Think about that one for a minute. It, it seeks to predict what you will actually do as opposed to what you say you will do if somebody asks you like a pollster or what you will or what you what you intend to do, what you think you will do. Yes, yes. Which two major groups hired these people to help them with data in the last two big elections? One was Brexit and the other was the Trump campaign. They used the psychometric people to figure out how to, how to, who to target, how to turn out their vote. And so when you ask how could there be, how could this happen, that there was a 10 point polling gap between the two going into election day and one beat the other, well, it's very simple. They use psychometric and they, they delivered the message to people that people voted that for for one for one side or the other they didn't think they would if you'd ask them they'd have said i'm gonna vote for that one or i'm not going to vote but they did because psychometric analysis is about figuring out what you're really doing not what you intend to do or say you do a psychometric analysis he uses all the things that that's on a smaller scale yeah um, but they're able to predict, like these people that gather data, if a male buys a certain type of, of uh, cosmetic, they know it's not for his wife and they figure he's gay, and he goes into that bin. I mean, seriously, I mean, that, they're tracking this stuff down too, uh, but they, they can predict what you will really do, not what you think you'll do. Your own self, I, I'm, on, I'm not going to do that or I'm going to do this. Uh, as opposed to what you think you do or what you say you'll what you report you'll do the only data that that reporter that pollsters can collect is what you say you will do what have i told you when we when, I, when we were in 602 what's the least reliable form of data self report and now we have some people who are making millions of dollars on that very very function that that very notion that these people don't even know what they'll do. They won't, they won't tell us the truth. Can we find out a way to figure out what they'll really do and then influence that to, 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 
things that they never even thought they would do, that they said they wouldn't do, or they would do something different. Can we influence that as we know enough about them and know which triggers to pull and buttons to push? Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. And so the outside reading book that I have for my doctoral students in statistics this semester is called Super. And that's one of the things that they talk about and doing regressions files and those things, but we talk about psychometrics. Uh, we're trying to get, I'm trying to push us into that. I mean, it may be a little bit too advanced, but the calculus itself, but the, the notions aren't that advanced. It's just the calculus that you have to do. And we don't get too deep into calculus in, uh, in DEOL, um, Doctor of Organizational Leadership. They're not educators, so we, we go in, but we don't use SPSS Paleo analysis, we use DEOL. Our workbook to do analysis with. And we really need to get into SPSS. If you get psychometric, it's a little deeper, a little more complicated. So we won't go into the, the calculus of it. I'm just trying to teach them the theories behind it, population sample, all, you know, from that, from something as simple as that, mean, median, mode, you know, central tendency, uh, frequency distributions, cues, you know, all, all, all the, the simple stuff. Um, and then how to calculate standard deviation, variance. Um, you know, uh, standard deviation is just the variance squared. I mean, you know, just just concepts more than I have them do a few math. You know, they have to do a little calculus, but not too much. But I'm more interested as they get the big ideas and understand how data is driving the world. Um, and leaders should understand that too. Uh, that people won't always tell you what they won't need. They, sometimes they, they, they don't know. Uh, they don't know what they really want or what they really need. But if you're working with them, alongside them, inspiring and motivating and participating with them, sometimes you can find out or you will know. If all you ever do is sit in your office and they just come tell you what they want, sometimes that's a dissatisfaction because although that's what they told you they wanted, they in fact, not been what they want. And then who are they angry at? That'd be you. Uh, and so you need to be out, you know, you need to be among the folks if, you, if you're going to make, if, if you're going to become a, a true leader and not just a manager. So how do you know? By watching their behavior, their actual actions. Um, see, that, see, that's. See that that's that that's a great question, Luke. I mean, if if they if they tell you one thing, but you observe them doing another, um, you observe their behavior. Which are you going to believe? What they told you or what you saw? Well, the whole point of getting out of the office and working with people is is so that you can see. And that's one of the things why you know. When we talked about the AFTEL in, in 602, I said, you can't survey for best practice because people will self-report that they're using best practice. It's an IQ test. It's not a, a survey of the best practices. You ask somebody, are you using the state mandated best practices? Oh, no, I'm not doing They're not going to tell you that. <laughs> what are they going to tell you? Oh, yeah, I'm using those best practices. But when you go out and watch them, what they do many times will be different than what they report. Self-report is the least reliable form of data. And that, that, that has a lot of implications for the leader. That's not just a, a theorem or leadership or something Dale said. What that means is if you want to know what's really going on in your building, you have to leave the office. And you have to not just walk around with your hands in your pocket. I always hated that term managing by walking around. So, you, so you're walking around with your hands in your pocket like an idiot. I mean, what, what good is that doing? You need to be engaged with groups in your building and with individuals in your building. That's why I said you need to learn how to form those leadership groups and how to engage and manage them. I went through that it's very specific uh, techniques last semester in 604 as we got to advanced level PLCs. A um, couple of good documents on that, on how to do that. But... Just, just walking around with your hands in your pocket and just where everybody can see you, that's of no value. You know, you become a caricature of, of a leader then. You become a, a, what is it, a Delbert cartoon then. 
assessment. The point is to be out, but not just to be wandering around, but to be engaged so you, and seeing what people are actually doing, not what they tell you that they're doing. All right. Come on, you can do it. All right. You've already been introduced to duties and responsibilities of the principal, and you know what the management functions are. These are your management functions. To grade and classify, accurate reports, improve instruction and community spirit, conduct fire drills and safety hazards. Uh, You can take it off your bucket list. You got to pull the fire alarm and start the fire drill. Y'all didn't wait to the last minute, did you? January 31st. Yeah, and it's the last day of the month. That wasn't good. We gave them a heads up. Yeah, people that When you when you become principal, here's an easy way to remember it. Always do it on payday, which is what the twenty fifth. Um, or if it's if your payday is the is it is it the last yeah. day of the month now? Yeah. Don't do that then. Yeah. I always when I did, I always remember whenever it was payday, which was like the twenty fifth or the fifteenth. We do it on payday. That's what it was, maybe. Yeah. But you need something that that's a regular event that happens every month on the same day, whether it's the tenth, the fifteenth. But don't don't do it on the last day. You'd be amazed at how many times you'll miss it, and somebody will report you. You get that five hundred dollar fine. Yeah. Don't don't wait till the last day of the month to do your fire drills. Uh, discipline, school property, report to law enforcement. Um, Property, make reports, emails, make available your budget and your school improvement plan, evaluate licensed employees, develop mandatory improvement plans. That goes back to that MTSS model. Transfer student records, sign driving eligibility forms, um, notify motor vehicles, uh, lose control, lose your license. Uh, establish a proven team name and work with military members, family, to address their needs. Those are, these are all your management functions. All management functions. Um, and so these are the half two things that you have to do as a manager, but everything else is a leadership function. Um, and so you need to be able to distinguish between those and understand that McGregor's X and Y is more than just a theory. It's, it's, you understand that you have to apply both of those um, in order to get the results that you need. Uh, Self-report is the least reliable form of data, and don't argue. Don't let it, that make you mad. Don't don't let that disturb you. Use that knowledge to say, "Oh, that means I've got to get out there with them." Uh, Instead of complaining about they didn't tell me the truth or they didn't know how many times you heard they didn't even know what they wanted. Well, if you'd been out there with them, guess what? You would have known what they wanted or what they needed. Well, I can't get them this or that or the other because they don't know what they need. How many times have I heard principals say that when I was supervising them? They don't know what they need. Well, do you think if you was out there with them, you might have a clue as to what they need? What that tells me is, is you know, you know, and sometimes all principals, Managers, many times, they will develop a hide, H-I-D-E, and that's not talking about like a outer skin, a hide in terms of what they will go and where they will be when they don't want to deal with, with things that they should be dealing with. Um, now, here's, here's a fallacy, and you won't, hear, won't read it in any textbook anytime soon. Curriculum people hide in the classroom. 
we have this mistaken notion that principals should be in the classroom all the time, you know, observing instruction, that that's always a good thing. You know, uh, curriculum people tend to hide to avoid conflict and, and managing the adults that they have to manage their behaviors. And so they'll go to the classroom and hide and they won't, you know, irate parent, now they're in the classroom doing observation. You know, operational people like me hide at the gym. We go down, you know, we're out the ball field, we're out at the gym or whatever. Uh, instructional people hide in the classroom. But what you have to know yourself is what is my hide? And I have to learn to manage that so it doesn't become a problem in, in my in my professional life. You know, that I want to go watch them play, you know, watch the PE classes play ball down in the gym or go out to the ball field or do whatever or meet with vendors or do something in the managerial realm. Uh, I have to control that and understand I need to be doing observations and be in the classroom. Uh, conversely, the people that, that that love curriculum and instruction need to remember that you know the school's not just going to run itself if you're hidden in a room all day. There are other things that need to be done. So you need to determine what your personal hide is, where you would hide if given the opportunity all day, and, and learn to limit that. You have to be honest with yourself. Again, self-report, and, and I guess and, and is, is, a word, is a least reliable form of data, and self-delusion is... is, is you know, it runs rampant, I guess. Um, but you need to know yourself in order to do that. So here's your management functions. Um, get that the bottom out of my way. Y'all don't need to see that spreadsheet. Okay. We've already done this one. We've already looked at MTSS for teachers. Will we apply both X and Y behaviors? We've already looked at the weekly schedule that says that you're to do discussion boards five and six, Hershey and Glickman, and X and Y and Know Thyself was tonight's lecture. Okay, we've covered that. All right. So I thought that's where we were. We should be right here. In the end, what makes a good principal? To kind of summarize, you know, all this management versus leadership, motivation, transformational, transaction. All right, put it in practice now. What makes a good principal? Um, the school is a family relationship. So Luke hit the first one right on the head. School is a family, building relationships. Uh, teachers are treated as professionals. Now, what, what does that mean to you? When, you, when we talk about that good to great, you remember we started out the very first night with good to great, and that was, what was it, four or five was recognized, and I said, recognize doesn't mean, oh, I know, yeah, uh, we'll stand you up, but recognize is if you send me an email, I'll respond. Yeah. If you call me, I'll answer the phone. If you flag me down the hall, I'll, I won't run the other way and claim I didn't hear you or tell you that I, you know, I've got something pressing at the, you know, at, at, at the other end of the building that, that that recognition is is that you are a peer and that you deserve to be heard and, and you deserve to be a, a part of the group, the family. Uh, uh, to me, that's what professional, you know, treating people as professional is, is that you acknowledge them, is that you recognize them, that you don't, you know, they send you an email and you don't just, you know, you know and then blow it off and never, you, they never, I mean, that's, that's more disrespectful and more demoralizing than sending them me email back that says, no, I'm not going to do that. That's, you know, just ignoring it just like they're not. But like they, see, that tells people that they, they don't matter. Well, and, and you know, to be treated professionally, your boss doesn't always have to agree with you. Mm. Like you say, uh, like the boss doesn't always have to agree with you. A lot of times, if you can agree, you disagree. Exactly. But the thing is, is like I worked for a principal for a year. And, you know, there were times we had opposite opinions on things, but, you know, she would look to me, I would look to her, and we would agree to disagree, and we were good with things, you know, you, you should keep going. But it was that she 
she would actually listen, listen to, to you. And I in turn listened to, mm -hmm. to her. And you know, so we had a rapport there. And that's not always the case in all situations, but she treated you as a professional. You came out of there, you may not have gotten the history you wanted, but you were heard, and that's all we really want. That's exactly right. Instruction in the school is data driven. We've talked about that many times. Um, database decision making, um, rather than anecdotal stuff that are choosing what we want and then and then trying to find data that supports it. Um, that's one of the things that in there. <clears throat> In the DEOL, they have a, uh, a project, uh, constituency project that they have to do. Um, and what we have to especially try to get them to understand is don't have a, don't, don't have a solution, go hunting a problem. Um, here's something we want to do now. Let's go find some data to support the notion of doing this. Um, in in the app cell and in, in in semester one for y'all it was you know we're going to do this and I go find some data that says we ought to be doing that in your PLCs we want we want to do we want to do this we want to run this program we want to do that let's find some data that supports that we'll call it our most pressing need <laughs> um, unfortunately that's that a lot of school a lot of school. I hate to call them leaders, but a lot of school people, that's the way they operate. They, they went to a conference and somebody showed, they, there was somebody there that had this program or that program or the other program, or they heard about something over another school. And they don't even look to see if it fits their school or not. Um, you know, we've talked before about when the, one of the former superintendents brought, uh, from Newport News brought AVID here. AVID's a wonderful program, but it only it only fits about 40% of the schools in the district. But that's all he knew was AVID, that was it, and he didn't know anything else. And uh, the data said that it only fit in about 40% of the schools, but he wanted 100% of the schools to do it, uh, because that's all he knew. I mean, that, that was his one trick, AVID. That was it, and, and you know, if if the answer wasn't Avid, he he you know he didn't have a solution. But Avid only was for for schools with you know minority populations for kids whose families hadn't gone to college, who who were um, what was it above uh, average or above intelligence, but underperforming in their grades. Well, if you look at the populations across uh, across the county. Um, that only identifies about 40% of the schools and only probably 50% of the kids in those schools. Um, but, you know, everybody from Davidson to Ballantyne had to do it. Now, why in the world would you have an AVID program at an IB school with 240 kids who are the best and brightest kids and every one of them's parents have graduate degrees? Why would you have an AVID program at that school? Because that's all we knew. We were comfortable with that. Now they should have had a study skills or something like that, or they could they could have done a lot of other things. Obviously, of the mind and you know spent that time doing things of that nature. But they had to have an ab pro because that's, everybody's got to have one. Uh, well, can you show us the data? Well, see, the the notion that everybody had to have one is anecdotal from your experience or something you heard or read or saw or something that you've experienced before. But data-driven decision-making doesn't go in with any preconceived notions or assumptions. You, you go where the data tells you to go. Um, that's scary sometimes because you may not get to do the things that you wanted to do. It may not be the program that you picked and thought you ought to be doing. Uh, but you, you have to you have to be willing to accept where the data takes you. And that's, it's easier said and done sitting here in the classroom than it is out in real life, because it's really scary. Um, there's safety in some things, and then sometimes it's kind of like stepping out on them to do others. They are student-centered. Remember, if you're asked, if it, if it paid the same, would you want to, 
work with students and stay in the classroom or would you want to work with adults and become an administrator? If it paid the same, which would you want? And the, and the answer has to be work with adults and be an administrator because that's the job you're interviewing for. Now, but when you're interviewing and you're asked that question, you have to make sure you understand that you want to work in a building run by adults for children. Run by adults for children and that you want to work with those adults. But you're running the, the organization for children to do the right thing for them. And, and not do things like design a schedule for the a master schedule for the convenience of the adults or put children at risk and in danger by having a sign-up sheet in the lounge for who's gonna cover what ball games in the evening. Given a choice, would you sign up to do ball game evening duty if you weren't, if it wasn't assigned to you? Of course you would. You might, you know, as a gag, you might write down somebody's name on the list that you don't like, that's not yours. <laughs> but the, you're, you're definitely, I have seen principals do that. In the old days, I saw principals who would, would take a list because they didn't want to make people mad, didn't want to be a leader, wanted to be a manager, would make a list of who's going to, and they'd, tell you, they'd put a note up in, in, the, in, the, in the mail room, everybody's got to sign up for two events, you know, for this month, and just left the sign-up sheet there. Now, how many people you think were stupid enough to do that? Nobody was, was enforcing it. No, nobody did it. Now. And they that well, somebody will show up. Somebody, you know, somebody will want to watch that ball game. And so somebody will come or somebody will want to see that event. And there'll be some people there. I don't know. And so, again, it's all fun and games when somebody gets their eye put out. Uh, you don't have adequate supervision and, and, you're, and you're hammered, you're throttled. And that's how a lot of the older administrators that were in when I first came in, that's a lot of them got invited to retire over things like that. Incidents occurred on their campus, things happened, um, and they didn't have adequate supervision. Um, they had... Can I get a, a high school football game or something? How many, you know, the size of some of the larger schools, how many staff members should be there? What we did, there was a formula in when I was principal, high school principal here, we got the district allotted the number of show pros, security people with the wands, mm -hmm. yeah. and we were allotted, according to size again, a certain number of uh, 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 off-duty police officers who were usually coordinated by our SRO, Isaac, and um, now if you had a particular rivalry game, uh, you would get additional ones, and that was handled through uh, the AD's office. Now, in terms of how many people were expected to come to the, to the staff, uh, again, it was according to how big the game we were, it, it, uh, you know, how big the rivalry was. The baseline was for us was 20% of the fact that it needed to be there, uh, except for certain games we needed more than that, especially if we did Big Friday down at Memorial Stadium. They wanted half your faculty at that. Um, because it's you know that's 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 a, that's a tough big gig doing Big Friday at Memorial Stadium, um, and so uh, twenty percent, twenty percent. So we would you know we would so what we would do is we would assign them, but we would provide dinner uh, down in the Culinary Arts Building right there at the football stadium where they just walk right out and were right there. They showed up just on time, came in. Miss Cannon and the culinary arts would, would fix dinner. I'd pay for it. We'd have dinner. We'd all sit down and have dinner together. As you know, that, that group that came that week that was assigned to be there at that game, um, you have five home games. You get 20 percent of your faculty. That means everybody will eventually have to do it one time. Now, and, but then you have some where they won't have, and then you, you wouldn't have one of those games every year. But for us now, we did Big Friday two years in a row, and then you had to pull more people in, and uh, that's a little bit more difficult. But you, you take and divide your faculty up, you know, twenty percent, so that if, you know you have five home games um, that everybody does once, and then we did dinner and culinary arts. So they had, they came, and got a free meal. We let them go home. They got we didn't make them stay. They got to go home. They came back, ate dinner, and, and then did the game. 
Would you expect all admins to be there? All of on Friday night, yeah, home games on Friday night. That's the district expectation is all admin be there. That's not just mine as the yeah. principal. That's district expectation. I all have to be there. Now, on other games, you, you work out a, a rotating schedule, um, just like you do with teacher observations. You know, you have rounds of observations. Everybody's got to. And that's one of the problems with hiring new people is, is that, they're not certified to do evaluations. That means that everybody else has to pick up an extra fourth or fifth or whatever until you get up to speed. Uh, and so the other administrators, the APs are very interested that you hire somebody that either has already has that certification and can do observation or plans to get it, you know, first day, um, PDQ pretty darn quick. Um, you divide up you divide up all of your super you know what, what you call your your supervision activities supervision being after hours duty you know duty rosters during the day lunchroom duty you went through the OMA you know what it is lunchroom duty you know bus duty car duty all that stuff that 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 is during the day stuff supervision schedule is after school activities um, the expectation is is that all administrators will show up for Friday night football other than that. Um, for basketball, Tuesday night game, uh, you can have one. Friday night game, you got to have two. Uh, and there's a formula for all of this stuff. Now, if you've got a particular rivalry game, or if you're when the Coliseum was still on Tybola, um, we had two teams here in the district that were ranked in the top ten nationally, not not the state, not the top. Mm -hmm. So ESPN came and did one of those Friday night games where they, it's a national game of the week on Friday on ESPN Friday night basketball. When we had Jason Parker was at West Charlotte and we had George Le, George Lynch and um, Chris Marcus. George went to Indiana. Bobby Knight was always in the stands here. That was back when Bobby Knight was still coaching in Indiana. And so we had, you know, we had two powerhouse teams with all these all you know five star players and. Bobby Knight in attendance, and Shashevsky was here from Duke, and uh, uh, Dean Smith, and then uh, Guthridge was here. Him, they came together. That's right before Dean stepped down. Um, you know, you had all these luminaries in the stands, and they would do interviews on camera, and they would show them and all that. So that was so big, we couldn't handle that in the gym. So we moved it to the Coliseum. And that meant we got security and show pros and all that. So if something looked like it was going to get out of control or be too big, we would move it somewhere where we had better control of it. CMS still does that. Um, sometimes it's bigger than what you can handle a facility that you got. And so uh, we did that Friday night classic game, ESPN national broadcast. We did it from the Tybola Road um, Coliseum. It got torn down before it got paid for. Can't make this stuff up. That was the best facility. Uh, had great parking, easy access, good park. I mean, I, I love to go uptown to the epicenter and, and uh, eat dinner at Black Fin and then walk over to the new Coliseum and watch. Now, they moved the hockey back to the Big Eye so I don't get to watch hockey, but watch basketball or something there. But um, it's, it's brutal to get in and get out because of the parking and uh, – it costs during if I come if we come for during the week, um, it's fourteen dollars to park in that uh, underneath where you can walk close by. But the problem is getting to it yeah. in the traffic. You got to get there like at four thirty before everybody makes a break out in the afternoon yeah. trying to leave town. If you can get there by four thirty, you can get that fourteen dollar parking spot. It's pretty nice, but. If you're if you if you're not going to get there early or you can't get there before 4:30, um, it's, it's it's not hardly worth it. You can park maybe over at Stonewall Plaza or something and walk that mile across town to get over there. But I mean the old call the the, the new old Coliseum uh, on Tyvola had great parking, easy you know right there off the interstate, easy in and out. You just pull right up and park and walk right in, and you could get in and out. Mm -hmm. We did graduation there, mm -hmm. and it was perfect. It was great, but uh, not 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 so much anymore. But um, 
those are all things that, that are, are calculated and you're worked with on, on, on the management pieces of that, but you've got to be paying attention. Yeah. Um, but you work it out. Now, I had an AP who was older and she didn't like doing night because she didn't like driving at night that I inherited. And so we kind of worked around that. But see, that that's not what you're supposed to do. I mean, that's, um, you got to be able to pull your end. Yeah. And that's why I, I said in Dale's top 10 for interviewing, if you remember back to that list of things, you need to be honest with people about the things like that when you're interviewing. If you can't do night duty, don't tell them, you, don't just sit there and not tell them and then they find out after they hired you. Do what happened out at Hickory Grove. I was out there in September and she'd already let her new, sep, her new August AP hire, she'd already let her go. Um, she had to leave it every day at four o'clock. Well, Hickory Grove's a late start school. They don't start until nine thirty. They don't. The kids don't get out till four thirty, and the teachers can't leave until four or five. And she said she needed to leave every day at four o'clock. Well, now she knew that this was a late start school when she applied for the job. She didn't bother to tell Aquinetta that though. Um, and she thought, well, once they hire me, they can't. They can't let me go. Well, sure they can. I don't care who your mama is. Yes, they can let you go if you can't come to work or stay at work once you're here. Um, the principal does not have the authority to let you not come and work your job every day and get paid a full salary. State's paying your freight. So that, that's one of those things. They reach out to families. You know, we had you do the skip to work with families and work with community partnerships. Um, you know, I'll, I say two things about school and, and people are sometimes insulted by this. <clears throat> Parents get the children they deserve um, through their behaviors, and uh, parents get the uh, get the schools that they deserve through their behavior. Um, both of those are truisms, um, but you need to reach out to them and give them the opportunity to be a great parent. Um, you need to give them the opportunity to step up and be a great parent. You, you need to extend the olive branch and, and be the person who is who is forming the partnership. Don't expect them to come knock your door down. You need to do the things that you need to do, and you need those people to be involved um, because parents get the schools that they deserve, and if they get involved and, and work hard for those schools and, and encourage their children in those schools, then they get better schools. Now, parents being involved doesn't mean they need to be in, in, in the classrooms every day. That actually hurts your test score, by the way, to have parents in, you know, can't cuss the cat farm there under your feet all the time. Um, when we're talking about support, it's yeah, we could get into what parent support is, but it's not just always being in the room every day. But you need to link up with them and have them on committees, school improvement team. You're required by law to have you know at least one on your school improvement team. But they should be in a lot of them. But they should be involved in a lot of things in the building, not instruction. You know, I've told you about the Star Report, where teachers with with. Uh, with 29 kids in their room and a teacher assistant actually do worse on tests than teachers with 29 kids in their room and no teacher assistant. Why is that? Because the teacher leaves them for the teacher assistant to teach them. Guess what happens when you have a lot of parent volunteers in schools? Guess what teachers do? They leave the parents to work with kids. Um, and unfortunately, that's, that, that, that's not really the plan that we want. Um, unfortunately, that's, that, that's actually detrimental for children. And so your plan shouldn't be to have all these parents in the room reading and working with kids. That needs to be the teacher's job. But there are other roles within the building that we could spend all night talking about that parents do need to portray. They have great reservoirs of energy. Um, you know, you can't go in, you know, if you can't get to work on time or if you've got to go take a nap and you know, all those all those cliches that you've heard, uh, you can't be in this business if you can't get up and go and, and, and have and have energy and optimism. You can't have a bad day. Not allowed. You are the last bastion of hope for the for the organization. You can't have a bad day. You can't come in and be tired and grumpy and uh, and and not have any spirit or or get up and go about you. Yeah, 
and he wanted to get his trainer, you know, thought back in play. And, and it was a really good book. And he sends out each week, he'll send out these little positive notes mm -hmm. for us to, you know, to get our minds set. Mm -hmm. And if you're going through a, a thankful walk mm -hmm. and everything, you can't be angry at anything and or, or upset or uptight and all whenever you're going through the list of all mm -hmm. thankful for. That, you know, yeah. Yeah. Keeps everybody upbeat. They promote school spirit and teamwork, which feeds right into what you're just saying. Yeah. Um, we've already talked about how important teamwork is when we were looking at those. Team is important, but that school spirit and keeping that spirit up, and you know, that's even one of the management functions that you have um, as a as a principal. According to 288, you're supposed to promote school spirit and community pride. Um, you know. And, but it, it doesn't need to be as I'm beginning to see it now, that us against them kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure that that's healthy. Uh, where, where, your, where your sense of community and teamwork and your sense of, of school pride is based on uh, hating others, mm -hmm. um, that, that's going too far. Um, you want to have pride and, and spirit in what you're doing and not uh, let's go beat them down and uh, that, that kind of stuff. Um, and because what happens when, when, when that becomes a predominant, that's when you get into what CMS is in the middle of right now in terms of pupil reassignment. We, we, we want to beat that community over there. We want to beat that school, but we don't want to just beat them a little bit. We want to pulverize them. We want everybody in our school that's on grade level. We want nobody in their school that's on grade level. We want to wipe them off the face of the map. That's, that's, the the <laughs> yes, I am, because I live there. Um, that's exactly what I'm talking about. They want to grind their opponents to dust. It's okay to have school spirit, but you have to look at the big picture. These people, their, their school spirit is leading them to, we don't want to just win a little bit. We don't want it to be competitive. Um, you know. Speaking of competitive, I was told today by one of the ladies that I work with that she's aware of two of the Hunts basketball players who are temporarily living with people who live up in that area. Really that's what I'm talking about. That's when school spirit, that's the kind of thing. I won't comment because I don't know personally. Yeah. Um, but that's what I'm talking about. School spirit's gone, gone, gone overboard. It's, it's, become, it's become fanaticism rather than spirit when um, there's an apartment complex uh, in, a, in, in a part of the county that has 27 football players from one team living in it. Um, how does that happen? I mean, that was real. That's been several years ago, but that was real. Uh, that football coach had to move on. He's no longer in Mecklenburg County, but uh, it's been quite. No, it wasn't in Independence. It was not in Independence. It was nearby there, though. Um, was not in Independence. I won't, I won't blame Tommy for that one. Um, and he was there, but uh, that's what happened. Uh, Tommy was what won how many state titles in the, in the 2000s? Uh, or the, what was it? Uh, from 2000, was it 99 to 2000, 90, was it not, 99 to 2009 or something like that? They won eight or 10, nine or whatever. It was just it was just stupid. And so as a result of that, another school felt the need to basically create a place for and bring kids in because uh, they got tired of getting their clock clean for 10 straight years and watching their arch rival win nine or 10 state titles in a row. Um, so the school in the neighboring town decided, you know, we got to take action. And so that's what they did. That's what I'm talking about. That's when school spirit has run crazy. Uh, when you've got now in Tommy's defense, Tommy didn't have a department. Uh, I, I'm not. I'm not a Tommy fan. He's. I know other things about him. He's not the finest person I ever met. Uh, let's just put it that way. But as far as I know, and I I know, um, they didn't. 
that the kids came there to live because they wanted to play for him. It wasn't the other way around. He, you know, he didn't go looking for him. He did not recruit. The neighboring school recruited, um, got business to give parents jobs, found apartments for them, and those kinds of things. They went went looking. Tommy was just a recipient of people showing up and said, "We want to play for you." Uh, there's a big difference. Um, and so, trust me, they would have crucified Rick if they could have, if they could have found one little sneaky thing wrong during that, you know, the principal there during that time. They eventually got him over an enrollment issue. But, uh, you know, they wanted him every year, but they never could get him because it, Tommy wasn't recruiting. They were coming to him. Now, I can't say that about the neighborhood, the neighbor school, though. They were recruiting and they were doing other things. Um, but it, it, it goes crazy. But it's not just athletics. There's other things, too. Um, some of the charter schools are now recruiting really heavy. You know, they're very smartest kids. Now, they don't do anything when they get them. They just get dumber the whole time they're there. But they're out recording. And, you know, private schools are giving scholarships now for, for athletes. But... There's other schools that are recruiting really smart kids now. We want to win big. The, the problem with that is, is they don't have the infrastructure there to deal with those kids, and they just basically play on their laptops all day, don't get a bit smarter, uh, sit and take SAT practice tests all day, try to make as high a score as they can, but then don't know anything when they get to school. That's going on. I mean, that that's community spirit run, run them up. Uh, stealing the other team's mascot in the old days. Now, you know, we we paint the rock. We're supposed to just paint the rock or whatever, but it goes a lot deeper than that. Um, so you have to learn how to manage that, that school spirit and not let it become so over the top. And But, of course, districts have to learn how to manage it too. And hence the, the problem of pupil assignment. We, we, we don't want it to be equitable. That, that's not the point. I mean, I, I, got, I was watching something the other night, and they were talking about equitable pupil assignment. And I was like, you're, you're an idiot. That's not what these people want. You're telling them that you're promising them equitable pupil assignment, but you're making them mad to start with because that's not what they're here for. We want a winning pupil assignment, not an equitable one, and we don't want it to be close when we win. Um, so they couldn't understand why people were continuing to be angry and upset and protesting when they promised them equitable assignment. <laughs> that wasn't what they wanted. They promote school spirit and teamwork. They develop leaders. Again, we don't hire the dean of men anymore and just let them be managers. We hire people that we expect to develop into leaders. That's what good principals do. Dean of Students is basically the old Dean of Men or Assistant Principal role, but you never leave that role. You just do management functions. You do discipline, you do buses, you do inventory. You never become a principal. You just stay in that role. CMS has now traditionalized that role or legitimized that role by instead of hiring assistant principals for administration as they used to call them and assistant principals for instruction now they just hire assistant principals and they hire dean of students who that's all they do is the the management functions that's that's all they do um and so we used to not develop leaders. Now, supposedly, they're going to try. If you're hired as an assistant principal now, you're supposed to be classless in terms of you're not an APA or an API. We'll train you to become a leader in all of it. Uh, I, I understand that they that that may be a little bit ambitious or may, that may be a little uh, delusional right now. But in theory, that's what CMS is doing is that they're trying, they're hiring people that they believe that they can develop into leaders. They're not hiring any assistant principals that they know that you're just gonna do management with. They have another group of people that do that now. Not really. They have good help. Uh, that's what we, that was the exercise that we did tonight. You divide up into groups and teams. And that's it. No, Luke just asked a very telling question. Is it, it, so it's not good to become a dean of students if you want to be an AP. Not really, no. 
you don't get paid any better. You get paid teacher pay. You do all the dirty work, and you they never really give you the opportunity to learn any leadership skills. You don't do any teacher observations. Now, there are some deans of students, I understand, that, that do instruction on the other side. I don't know of any, but I've heard that rumor. Now, if that's the case, that might not be a bad job, but if all you're doing is bus duty and books and inventory and fire drills and discipline all day, um, your chances of getting to be principal in Charlotte Mecklenburg are pretty much zero. They always have been. They always have been. Because CMS was the first district to differentiate APIs and APAs back a long time ago. They lost the lawsuit and had to stop. But, um, you know, back in the 80s, they had assistant principal for uh, administration, assistant principal for instruction. The APA was the old dean of men kind of thing where you just did the management part. And then those people never got principal jobs. And so they sued, and the district had to stop calling it that, but it still works the same way. So now they have just, they just call them dean of students. Their teachers are not on an administrative track anyway, and so they can't complain about not getting hired as assistant principal because they're just teachers. And they're and and they are, are in a teacher role. Um, nobody promised them that they'd get to be an administrator. That they that they would move up. But some people like doing that. But if you want to be principal, that's not. I don't think that's a good route to go. Um, you you need to be an assistant principal that is well rounded and is a leader, and. Is, has the ability to be developed as a leader by your principal, as an assistant principal. Lorraine, you still with me? I am. Any of this makes any sense at all? Perfect. We do a lot. Of, we do most of it in mm -hmm. County. I hope that I hope that it seemed somewhat cohesive and not too random. Um, yeah. So this will conclude the uh the online portion for the evening and and the, the instructor input i um, just have one question for you yes because my mind is just starting to come back together where do we you, you said you wanted us to upload the cap and all i see on discussion board is peer reviews so where does that get uploaded again let me double check. That's a good question. Let me double check and make sure. I just see cap. I just see final reviews. I don't see like this is where you put your paper. Is that it right there? See, they all say peer reviews, but where do you want ours? To, oh, I see cap. You have an assignment. Okay, hold on. Let me assignment go Dropbox. I didn't go down low, low, far enough. You like that lady that that sent me an email that said it wasn't there, and I said it's on page two. She said you should have told us there was a page two. I said that was that what that two at the bottom of the page. Meant. <laughs> <laughs> I can't make that up. She was mad that I didn't tell them that it was page two. I went to discussion board, not the assignment Dropbox. That's why. Okay. Okay. I thought it was that. Now it could have not been there. I think they just said I put it in there last week. So. You were probably right to begin with. Okay. I probably just did that later on. All right. So you're going to be with us next week. Now, don't push it. If you can't make it, we'll be on video again, but we'd love to see you. You have All a good right. evening. I'm going to sign off now. I'll let you know. Thank you. All righty. Bye-bye. Right. Stop share. End meeting.